Satish. I'm one of the registrars. Uh, I'm giving this talk today on the NICE guidelines on DVT. And the reason I just chose that because uh, DVT is something which is very closely monitored. If you have any DVT in hospital, um, then there is always an inquiry whether uh, there was something which was preventable in that. Also, DVT incidents are widely published. You will see newspapers coming out with, oh, hospital gave this patient a preventable DVT. And as we all know, it can be life-threatening. But most important for FRCS, examiners hate anticoagulants. They don't like this rivaroxaban and all that because it leads to all this hematoma and infection based infection rates. And second most important thing, the DVT a guideline by NICE has been recently updated. So it could be a hot topic to just see that whether you are up to date with the new guideline. Right? So what does the guideline say? The guideline says that all patients which are seen by orthopedics should have a DVT assessment as soon as they present for admission and they, there is a risk assessment tool in which you take uh, uh, like you take into consideration the patient's morbidities, patient's mobility status and their bleeding risk and you have to balance the risk of DVT versus the risk of bleeding from the profile axis which you will be giving and if you decide to give a chemical profile access, then it should ideally be started within 14 hours. That's what the NICE guidelines say. And in this current time of medical legal cases, it's very important to tell the patient and the carer about the benefits as well as the risks of the profile access which you will be giving. Like it's a common practice to tick mark the box, okay, start in oxyparin. But if that patient has uh, berries aneurysm and they develop uh, intracranial bleed from it, then they will come back and say, did you tell the patient that you are at an increased risk of bleeding with the inoxyparin? So it needs to be talked to the patient and the relative and documented. Right, so uh, what all uh, is advised for DVT prophylaxis is first is anti-embolic stockings. So for that, just for general knowledge, you should be aware that they should be of the correct size and the size needs to be reassessed after surgery because there can be some edema of that leg. The pressure of that stocking is 15 millimeters of mercury and they need to be removed at least twice a day. And contraindications to, to their use are peripheral vascular disease, someone with paralysis or someone with fragile skin or cross deformities of the leg. Now the most important uh, things which could be asked in the exam is the DVT prophylaxis in uh, patients who are undergoing elective hip and knee replacement. That's where the change has happened recently. So previously it was all 28 days to 35 days of either uh, inoxiparin or rivaroxaban. But uh, I think last year it has now been updated and aspirin, which was initially not considered to be enough to cover, has been brought back into the picture. So the current guidelines say that it has to be 10 days of low molecular weight heparin and then you can shift the patient to 28 days of aspirin along with the stockings or you can carry on with the previous uh, schedule which were like low molecular weight heparin for 28 days or rivaroxaban for 28 days. And someone who is, uh, has contraindications for all of these can also be put on apixaban or dabigatrin. Similarly, with the uh, total knee replacement uh, guidelines, the important change here you can manage without any inoxiparin or rivaroxaban. So that's the biggest change. The consultant used to hate their patients coming back with big hematomas, oozy wounds, getting secondary infections. So you can put them only on aspirin. That's what the current NICE guidelines say. So this might be of interest to any knee surgeon if they don't like the rivaroxaban. But you can still carry on with 14 days of uh, the low molecular weight heparin or rivaroxaban again if none uh, of them is suitable to the patient, apixaban, dabigatrin. 
right now we come to the other surgeries so uh, anyone undergoing arthroscopy if the surgery is less than 90 minutes in a low risk patient then there is no need to give any prophylaxis however if the patient is high risk or surgery more than 90 minutes then again like a knee replacement uh, 14 days of low molecular weight heparin with stockings Foot and ankle surgery, same profile, now more than 90 minutes, high risk patient, you're putting uh, below elbow, below knee or above knee plaster, then uh, 42 days, that's six weeks of uh, anticoagulants to them. Upper limb surgery, somewhat similar, uh, general anesthesia, more than 90 minutes, high risk patient, a surgery which might lead to reduced mobility such as a shoulder surgery in a patient who uses a Zimmer frame or some one thing which is going to make them less mobile, then you give them uh, again prophylaxis till their mobility is better. Now this this is a controversial area. So elective spinal surgery, uh, the guideline says that if the patient is at low risk, then you just put them on stockings and intermittent calf compression whereas if they are at high risk uh, then you start the low molecular weight heparin after 24 to 48 hours now if you give it before 24 hours then you need to do an mdt approach use uh, take help from a hematologist and any other comorbidities if they are here you talk to the specialties the reason for the the spine elective spinal surgery is a controversial area regarding dvt prophylaxis so you just mentioned this word that it this is the guideline and i would always seek opinion from a hematologist regarding the best way of prophylaxis depending on the risk assessment similarly for spinal injury it's somewhat not very clear because again you are worried of a hematoma developing intradurally leading to compression of the cord so the guideline says that uh, in a spinal injury patient, you start with only anti-embolic stocking and intermittent calf compression on admission and reassess it after 24 hours. And if the patient is at risk of DVT and not going to have surgery, then you start prophylaxis, chemical prophylaxis for 30 days. For major trauma, the guideline says Again, anti-embolic stockings and calf compression and reassess VT risk daily. So again, you have to balance the risk of uh, DVT versus the risk of bleeding depending on the injuries they are having. By hip fracture, we all know hip fracture patients are on DVT prophylaxis, but what needs to be aware in the NICE guideline is that you need to stop clexane 12 hours before and if they are on funda perinox 24 hours before surgery and you can restart clexane 6 to 12 hours and funda perinox 6 hours post-op and again for lower limb immobilization again this is quite a hot topic because of the incidence of dvt in outpatients we in our hospital there was a big meeting regarding it that patient who are put in below knee plasters and non-weight bearing, uh, a young patient developed extensive DVT, came in with pulmonary embolism. So the guideline says that they need to have low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinox for six weeks. And in people who are already on aspirin clopidogrel, you have to closely assess the benefits and risk of DVT. As per the guideline, aspirin or clopidogrel will not fully prevent a DVT, though they slightly reduce the risk, they might still need a further anticoagulation uh, if the patient is found to be at high risk. But that addition of that anticoagulation must be weighed against the risk of bleeding in that patient. And if we are giving any chemical prophylaxis, we need to reduce the dose according to the uh, renal profile of that patient. Now, this is a brief uh, slide on the mechanism of action of uh, these anticoagulants uh, that we have just discussed. So, heparin, which is the previously used anticoagulant, it potentiates antithrombin 3, which inhibits thrombin that is factor 2 and factor 10. And clexane, which is a derivative, a low molecular weight heparin, has more action on factor 10 than factor 2. 
Riva Rock band and Epixa band, which are the newer ones, they directly inhibit factor 10A. And Dabigatlin, which is another oral anticoagulant, uh, is a direct thrombin inhibitor that is factor 2. So most of the uh, anticoagulants that we are using are either inhibiting factor 2 or factor 10. The most common being Flexin and Rivaroxaban, they both uh, have action on factor 10A. So that's something which is to be remembered. Tabigatrin, if we can remember, that's factor 2. And Warfarin, uh, obviously it inhibits the enzyme factor vitamin K epoxide, which is needed for the activation of 2, 7, 9, 10. So these four factors so you need to know here the uh, intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. So uh, the warfarin will affect both of them because of the factors involved. I think that's about it, the guideline I wanted to tell. These, uh, I don't expect uh, this to be asked as a direct question, but this can come up either in the basic sciences or as a part of a uh, a discussion on hip replacement, knee replacement, or trauma scenario, or the controversy in spine, to be aware that you are aware of the current NICE guideline, you are able to quote it uh, with confidence. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, so that's a thank you, Ashish. It's a very informative and uh, and to the point of presentation. So there's a very key thing there in terms of this new update and they will, they will be a hot topic, particularly with the lower limb um, sort of immobilization because I don't think it's just not just your hospital. I think quite a number of hospitals around the country have had similar problems. I know we have discussions as well. It's interesting that this is a new update. Was it, when's this update from? Is it from March last year or earlier this year? Sometime last year. Sometime last year, okay. August or something. Always so. Um, and certainly it's worth disseminating it as well to our colleagues um, anyway in terms of a practical usage. I mean there have been quite a number of meta-analysis uh, over the years after the omission of aspirin from the original DVT prophylaxis guidelines which actually shows it is as good as, if, um, as the, the, these more expensive anticoagulant drugs with less of a hematoma risk um, than the stat, than sort of the, these, as I say, more modern ones. But this is a very good presentation. So, as I say, it's going to be on um, the Author Mentor sort of YouTube site. So, if you missed it from the beginning, please do go and look at it. Um, it is important because it is a common question in the Viva. Um, and, it will, and also, <laughs> I've had the basic science paper station where I've been asked to draw the, the um, intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. So uh, it's a nightmare, but just have a refresh yourself, be able to draw it quickly and talk through it. You don't have to do anything spectacular, but if it looks like you know what you're doing, the exam, the references. But they will throw in questions about um, current guidelines and, 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 what you, and what your practice is. And demonstrating that you use a guideline is at minimum level seven, because you've got evidence, but it's evidence based, hopefully. Okay. Right. Um, so if, if no one else has any other questions to do, uh, to, uh, to ask about that, we'll move on to the Viva part today, which Nikki is kindly going to do for us. I'm not going to record this, so don't worry. 